Welcome. This is our first uh, lecture uh, that will, uh, and we'll be covering chapter one um, in this lecture. And uh, I just wanted to orient you, this, since this is our first lecture, I wanted to orient you to how I organize my lecture slides and give you some advice about how to use them to uh, most efficiently in your studying and learning the material in the course this semester. Um, so, uh, like subsequent chapters, I've organized uh, the Chapter 1 lecture slides, um, starting with the objectives of the, that I want you to learn um, from reading the chapter and listening to the lecture. Um, I always start my lecture slides with uh, the objectives, and then they're followed by some terms that you should learn, or uh, if you're already familiar with them, great. Um, then I have the lecture material, and at the end, I have a slide that um, gives you some practice problems that you should look at uh, from the text. Now, um, I would suggest that you, uh, I've given you a, a PDF form of all of these slides, so there's no need to copy them down word for word, um, and I would suggest that you look at that PDF of the slides first before you go to read the chapter. Then you read the chapter and take notes, uh, paying special attention to the uh, objectives that I've listed on the first couple of slides. Uh, and then um, listen to the lecture, um, take additional notes to supplement what notes you've taken from the book. And then you can use those notes to um, study as well as to do the homework. So let's start with chapter one. Chapter one, I'm going to tell you, give you an introduction to microbiology. I expect that you uh, will understand um, the various members of the microbial world by the end of this lecture, as well as um, some of their important features and how they're linked to humans. Um, and um, important features of the different members, how they are similar and related, um, as well as how they're different and how they're classified into the domains of life, um, and how some are actually not even considered living uh, organisms, but are rather microbial agents. Um, and then um, how these are related to us um, in a good way as far as our normal microbiota, as well as in um, the way that you will come most into most contact with through your work in the healthcare field as pathogens, um, those germs that make us sick. So how they're linked to infectious disease. All right, so let's get started. Um, I will let you look at the terms that you should be familiar with on your own. Uh, you should be able to uh, get the definitions for these uh, from the lecture. Uh, if not, you should find them in your book. Okay, so I just wanted to remind us all of what characterizes something as living. Uh, because we are going to, being um, a microbiology course, we are going to study biology, um, the study of life. And so what is it that... Um, makes or defines something as living um, and something as non-living. And this will become important to understand in uh, understanding key differences between members of the microbial world. So the seven common traits are that all life is composed of cells. There are levels of organization. Um, most commonly in microbiology, these are very small, single-celled organisms that we're going to be studying. Um, but whether uh, an organism is unicellular or multicellular, as we are, um, there are different levels of organization, and that uh, anatomy and the physiology of the organism is what we'll be studying um, as part of our course this semester. Uh, all living things use energy. Um, that energy helps them to drive their metabolism, and it helps them to grow and reproduce, uh, and uh, key molecules within 
um, these organisms uh, enable them to uh, respond to stimuli. So they're key communication pathways um, that allow for the response to stimuli, as well as um, through reproduction or um, other means, uh, living things can adapt to their environment. And that's true of microorganisms as well as other uh, macroorganisms that you've already studied. Um, for example, the humans, human body. Uh, so remember that um, you've already studied a lot about the human body and these traits in the human body. But when we come to study microorganisms, these are really very tiny, invisible life. Um, and so for a long time, no one knew that microorganisms even existed. Um, so biology was a field devoid of the study of these tiny organisms. But we understand now um, from so far what we've learned about these um, tiny uh, organisms is that they probably were the first forms of life on Earth um, and that today they are essential to our survival, uh, not just those microorganisms that are directly associated with our body, but those that are in the um, environment. Um, and they, they exist in all ecosystems, all um, biomes within um, our Earth. And so it's essential, these uh, microorganisms serve uh, roles within our environment of recycling essential nutrients, organic molecules, organic elements that are necessary for our bodies to function, our metabolism to um, occur, and for us to be able to have enough oxygen to breathe, etc. Um, and so over time, though, uh, just like we talk about human evolution, uh, microbes have changed. Um, and their relationships with other organisms, multicellular organisms, have changed as well. And so we'll look a little bit about how uh, our relationship with these um, tiny invisible organisms, um, what we know about it so far. So I use two terms, um, microbes and microorganisms. Um, they're usually used interchangeably, but I'll um, come to the, a key difference um, in a moment. But as far as microbes and humans, there's good news and bad news. Good news is that um, we have about 10 times or probably more than 10 times uh, um, as many microbial cells associated with our body, either in our body or on our skin, um, than we do actually have human cells. So just by the sheer number, 10 times more microbial cells than our own human cells, we can infer that this, these microbes are really key to our survival and our development. And through the Human Microbiome Project, we're really learning more about this relationship of these good microbes and the microbiome, um, the environment of our body, and how it serves as a habitat for these microorganisms. In addition, um, we rely on microbes for food production, for preserving food, for treating infection, um, for um, mining precious minerals, and for uh, bioengineering, uh, because many of, them, many of them serve as biotechnology tools, so developing new med medicines uh, using microorganisms or their products. Um, the vast majority of microorganisms that are uh, on our Earth are harmless to us. But of course, even though it's a small number of micro microorganisms uh, and microbes that uh, affect us negatively in causing infectious disease, it is a significant and critical proportion of these microorganisms. And so a lot of the semester we'll be talking about some examples of micro, microbes and how they cause disease um, and how, why they are uh, really the, the leading cause of 
uh, deaths for humans worldwide. Okay. So what is a microbe? Um, well, as I mentioned, a microbe is a microorganism, a very tiny, uh, invisible uh, form of life. Uh, and um, the simple definition is that um, it is simply, a, a microbe is simply a tiny, invisible, to the naked eye, form of life. But there, it gets more complicated when you start to study the, the variety of microbes. Um, so, for example, some microorganisms can actually be seen with the naked eye, so they aren't invisible. Um, and others um, are able to grow multicellularly, uh, and so, again, we can see them without um, any uh, tools to aid in making them bigger so that we can see them. Um, in fact, many microbes that are unicellular form communities in their growth um, called biofilms, so for example, bacteria. Um, and these communities can be seen um, by the naked eye, so they're macroscopic. Um, in addition, some microbes are not organisms. They're not considered living. Um, in, they, they lack a cellular structure. Um, they may even lack uh, genetic material in the case of prions. And so um, these organisms uh, kind of fall out of that very simple definition of a microbe as a microscopic organism. But for our purposes, we'll stick with this simple definition um, and uh, with the assumption that you understand um, these key caveats. So let's look at the members of the microbial world in a little bit about how they are similar and how they're classified and how those differences are used to classify them. Um, so all members of the microbial world are microbes. But only some of them are organisms, as I alluded to um, when we were talking on the last slide. Um, so if we're just looking at the microorganisms, they can all be classified into those three domains of life that you lear learned in general biology. Bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. So these. Um, three domains can be uh, divided into two groups based on their cell structure. Um, and uh, prokaryotes, um, the prokaryotic cell structure where it's unicellular, has no internal compartments, no nucleus, um, are the cell structure of both those organ microorganisms in the domain bacteria as well as microorganisms in the domain archaea. But microorganisms in the domain eukarya have a eukaryotic cell structure. It's more complex, has internal compartments that are bound by a lipid bilayer, a membrane, a biological membrane. And um, so all of these members of the microbial world, algae, protozoa, fungi, um, and helminths, are all uh, part of this domain of eukarya. Now, there's a dashed line to helminths because unlike algae and protozoa and some fungi that are unicellular, helminths are always multicellular and can always be seen with the um, naked eye in their um, adult form. However, they do have microscopic forms of their life cycle, like the egg cycle, so they are um, and they also uh, cause infectious diseases, so they are grouped uh, and um, included in these members of the microbial world. On the other hand, there are some uh, microbes that are non-living. They're infectious agents or microbial agents, and those include viruses, which you're familiar with, viroids, which are a simpler form of virus that only infect plants, and prions, which have no genetic material but do cause infectious neurological um, diseases like spongiform encephalitis. All right, so 
just uh, an aside for a moment on nomenclature because um, you'll see the names of organisms uh, within your text and I just want you to be familiar with how um, microorganisms are named um, and that's following um, the Linnaeus's um, two or binomial nomenclature where um, the first name is the uh, genus name and the second name is the species epithet or the species name, a specific name um, for a subset of organisms within this genus. Um, and the names um, are always written with the genus name capitalized and the species name lowercase. Uh, and they're always in italics or underlined. Uh, we can um, abbreviate the genus name, but we never abbreviate the species name. So Astrichia coli uh, would be E. coli, more familiarly. Um, and um, in looking at how these microbes are related and how they differ, we first need to step back to our basic understanding of biology. And I just want to refresh your memory uh, about the genetic basis of um, life. So remember that DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, is um, this replicating, self-replicating material that's found in all living things uh, that carries the information that defines that organism. Okay, so all the information um, is contained in what we call a genome. Um, it's unique to that species and um, it's found in all cells within that species or within that multicellular organism. Um, genes are a portion of that genome, a portion of that DNA, that carries a specific trait of an organism. So we can actually study DNA, its sequence, the sequence of bases here in the middle of this double helix, um, the gray and the blue and the red here in the center of the um, double helix are the bases, and there's a certain sequence to them um, the adenines, guanines, cytosines, and thymines, um, that if it's very similar, then that means that organism is more closely related than if the, the pattern of these nucleotides is very different. And um, the way that we determine that is by sequencing the DNA or determining or kind of reading that code uh, in order by doing DNA sequencing. So the basis of all disease boils down to what genes um, those microorganisms or microbial agents have. And, um, and really the difference between those microorganisms that are harmful to us that are pathogens and those that are um, benign or beneficial to us um, is based in their genetic makeup. So as I mentioned, there are these two major groups based on the anatomy or the structure of the cells that make up these organisms. Um, and so you should know the difference. I uh, should, should have already learned this in uh, general biology. Um, prokaryotes um, have no internal compartments, no internal uh, lipid bilayers. They simply have one lipid bilayer around the entire cell. That's the cell membrane. So they don't have any nucleus or any organelles. Um, and this includes all of the microorganisms in the domain bacteria and archaea. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, are more complex. They do have internal compartments. They have a nucleus that contains, that's a uh, bound by a uh, double lipid bilayer called the nuclear uh, envelope. And um, they have internal membrane 
uh, bound organelles such as the endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi, lysosomes, vacuoles, uh, endosomes, etc. Um, so review these. Um, we'll uh, all expect you to know those differences um, between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Uh, and these include microorganisms such as fungi, protozoa, algae, and helminths. So just quickly to, to introduce you to the various members and help you to um, at least initially know some key distinctions between them. Um, the bacteria and the archaea are very similar. Uh, they're both prokaryotic. Um, they're both around the same size, although this size, so a typical bacterium is about one to two microns, but it can be uh, some bacteria are actually um, so big that you can see them without um, the aid of a microscope, so they can be quite big. So there's always exceptions to the rule, um, but on average, they're about one to two microns, uh, micrometers. Um, and this um, symbol here that looks like a U means micro, and then the M is the meter. So micrometers are microns in size. Uh, and you should review your... Um, these are metric measurements, so review your metric measurements if you're a bit rusty on that. We'll be only using metric measurements in this course. Um, and uh, bacteria are unicellular. They only have one cell, but they do grow as groups of cells, uh, communities that we call biofilms, um, or they can grow individually, um, or they can form filaments. And Bacteria are found virtually everywhere. Everywhere we've looked we've found in, in the uh, environment, we've found bacteria from um, the geysers of, um, of Yellowstone Park to the forests, to our own body, etc. Archaea, on the other hand, they're genetically distinct um, and they have uh, some key differences in their cell wall composition, so anatomically they're distinct. Um, and they're called extremophiles because they're not found everywhere in, in any environment, but instead in very uh, hot or very dry or very acidic or very salty environments, so hence their nickname extremophiles. So down at the bottom of the ocean under in, incredible pressure, archaea can live in deep sea vents. Um, that spew out very hot gases from the core of the earth. Um, another key difference is that bacteria, a small portion of them, are um, pathogenic, whereas um, we have no known record of any archaea being um, pathogenic, so they're non-pathogenic as far as we know. So moving on to the eukaryotic members of the microbial world, uh, protozoa and algae are protists. They're unicellular. Algae can be also multicellular, but we'll be focusing on unicellular. And um, they, uh, in the case of protozoa, they're defined by their motility, so they're grouped and classified by their motility. And they can be either living uh, free or uh, relying on a host. Uh, to um, survive, and in that case, they're parasitic. So they can be uh, pathogens of humans um, or other animals. Algae, on the other hand, they're mostly in aquatic, uh, aquatic environments, um, although some are found on the land. And they're unique because, uh, or different, distinct from protozoa, because they are capable of carrying out photosynthesis. Um, they contain chloroplasts, um, which help to capture that light energy and convert it into a, a useful form of ATP for um, the algae to grow. And as such, they serve kind of as that basic food source. Um, there are even um, protozoa will even feed on um, bacteria and algae as part of their diet. Fungi, uh, also eukaryotic. However, they are not motile. They rely on spores that passively travel through the air in order to 
um, move from place to place from a, nutri a nutrient rich environment to the next nutrient rich environment. They grow by absorbing nutrients across their plasma membrane, but they also have a cell wall, which is important, uh, as do algae. However, um, protozoa lack a cell wall, and that's also a distinct um, a distinction between them and other um, microorganisms of the eukaryotic um, uh, group. Um, and then just an aside about cell walls, fungi have a distinct cell wall comp composition um, that's not like um, bacteria. Uh, it's mostly chitin or other glycans um, and also distinct from algae, which have a cell wall made similar to plants made of cellulose. So the vast majority of fungi are saprophytic. That means they're growing on dead and decaying material, and they're important recyclers in our environment. But some of them can cause disease in humans. Um, they rarely cause a, a primary infection, in, meaning they rarely cause disease in healthy individuals, but they often cause disease in immunocompromised or um, individuals with a weak immune system. So they're opportunistic pathogens, is what we call them. Viruses, on the other hand, are the example of the non-cellular um, microbial agents. Um, and they are composed of, uh, so they don't have any um, organelles that would enable them to reproduce independently, and, and so they lack that cell structure. However, um, they do have genetic material. They, unlike um, living organisms, which have both DNA and RNA, so two forms of nucleic acids, uh, viruses only have one or the other, um, but it, these um, genetic, the, the genetic material that they do have carries genes that are necessary for uh, producing another complete infectious virus particle. Uh, and so viruses are required to use a host cell because they're incapable of reproducing outside of a host, outside of a host cell, they, it is necessary that they take over the metabolism of a host cell in order to reproduce and make more virus. So they have some qualities of living organisms, but not all of the qualities. Uh, there are important um, human pathogens, uh, as well as now they're often used as biotechnology tools in treating disease, uh, for example, cancers in delivering the, the molecules uh, or the agents that are used in, as anti-cancer agents directly to that tumor. Other uh, non-living members of the microbial world include viroids, uh, which are also acellular or non-cellular. Um, they don't have DNA, but they do have genetic material in the form of RNA, which carries genes that are necessary for them to generate more virus. And they don't cause disease in humans, but they do cause plant disease. And then finally, prions, which really, uh, within my lifetime, um, set molecular biology on its head by uh, the surprising finding that it was indeed an infectious agent that contained no genetic material at all. So no DNA, no RNA, normally, the protein is found in our neural tissue, but if you somehow acquire the misfolded protein, um, either by ingesting contaminated meat, such as mad cow disease, um, would uh, transfer that misfolded protein, or by a uh, genetically inherited um, form, uh, as far as Creutzfeldt Jakob syndrome is uh, concerned, that misfolded protein can then cause the normal protein to become the disease form. And hence, over time, you get this neurodegenerative disease. Um, so we know that microbes exist now because we can see them. Um, but prior to that time, it was 
and diseases were known, but there was no link between diseases and their causative agent. So really, the advent of microscopes um, were the first um, introduction to the mi microbial world. And uh, Robert Hooke, in 1665, um, was the first to build a compound microscope. And he looked at various tissues, plants and uh, animal tissues, and he noticed something about them that they had in common. Here in this um, drawing that he made that was published, um, so really the first published record of um, the organization of tissue, um, is, this is from a cork plant. And you could see these kind of repeating, regular, regularly repeating uh, boxes um, that he noticed in other um, organisms, especially plants, especially obvious in plants. Um, and these he called cells because they reminded him of the small compartments that monks lived in um, in monasteries. And so it was really his observations through this compound microscope, meaning it has two lenses and so can give greater magnification than previous uh, lenses. Um, it's really through that, those, his observations, that we s began to understand that cells are that fundamental unit of life. Now, he didn't look at microorganisms, but another um, um, individual who was actually not a scientist or a doctor, but uh, he was a, a drapery merchant, and he needed to use the lenses to look at the details of the threads, but he was particularly adept at grinding the lenses and got, even just with a single lens, much more powerful uh, magnification than Hooke did with his compound microscope. And so he was able to look through these lenses and he was just curious about light uh, things in general and so he would look at various things including um, a drop of pond water and he published um, these drawings of what he saw in the pond water these tiny rod shape or circular uh, organisms or even wavy organisms that moved from point to point. And this he called, these he called animolecules, but really his was the first written record of microorganisms. Um, so at this time, um, people did not really understand you know, a natural question that would arise from these tiny organisms is, where did they come from? And people were always um, questioning, um, where does life come from? And with multicellular organisms, humans, um, it was clear that, you know, humans would mate and then they would have children. And so humans came from humans. But what about these tiny, newly discovered organisms? And so for many biologists, they believed that they just kind of magically appeared, um, that many organisms were able to spontaneously generate. Um, and it wasn't until some really extensive experiments uh, over almost a century of time that we understand uh, really the, the biogenesis uh, is responsible, so pre-existing organisms is responsible. So I just wanted to uh, go over some of these experiments that um, are key to our understanding of how microorganisms arise. So uh, an Italian, Spallanzani, uh, um, used uh, a kind of ground up meat broth um, and observed that if he left a flask of this meat broth open to the air, like a beaker, um, it would become cloudy and full of life. Um, but if he covered, if he boiled the broth and then um, left it covered, he would not find um, any life. So he sealed, you know, if he stoppered it or sealed it somehow so that um, no uh, air could get in it, um, then there was no life. It remained clear. 
So this was the first indication that it wasn't just that nutritious broth that was like spontaneously uh, giving rise to this new form of life. Um, but his detractors said, you know, you really have blocked the entry of oxygen. And so that's why the life can't grow, because they need oxygen. Um, and so later, um, Louis Pasteur, a French um, scientist who was fascinated with um, the spoilage of food and um, the making of wine, and um, he developed a kind of flask that was still open. It's called an S neck or a swan neck flask, and you can see a picture of it here. It was curved, so it, should, uh, it was still open to the air, but that anything, any kind of dust or sediment in the air would be incapable of reaching the nutritious broth inside the flask. And after he boiled the broth and let it sit, um, he found that the broth remained clear. Uh, so this was really a, a critical turning point in, that debunked spontaneous generation, that these um, broths themselves could not spontaneously give rise to life. Many people tried to repeat his experiment and found um, that the results were inconsistent. And John Tyndall was one of those, um, actually an Irish um, physician and scientist, that um, found that sometimes he would boil the broth and it would still give rise to um, a cloudy, growing media full, full of um, microorganisms, and other times it would remain clear. Um, and um, so he, he eventually um, determined that there was some more resistant, heat-resistant form of life that we now know are endospores produced by bacteria under very stressful conditions. And um, so, he, so now, in order to truly sterilize um, materials, whether they're liquid or um, uh, tools for instruments for surgery or anything that needs to be truly free of microbes, we use an autoclave in which rapidly um, boils the um, liquid, if you have a liquid, or heats up the material but also has high pressure to destroy those endospores so that really, truly, the material is free of microorganisms. And in the lab, all of our lab materials are autoclaved, all of them that are not sensitive to heat. So here with this series of, um, of experiments, um, here shown in more detail uh, in this figure where the broth on the swan neck flask is boiled, it's allowed to cool, and then for years, even there's still a flask in the Pasteur Institute in France that you can go and visit today that's still to this day, more than 100 years after the experiment was done, um, is clear. But he found if he tipped the flask or, and allowed the broth to come into this S swan neck, or if he broke off this, the S neck, then just a matter of hours or days later, um, he would get a cloudy broth um, that was full of life. Uh, and so this was really the beginning of the understanding that all living things arise from pre-existing uh, life, uh, the theory of biogenesis. And later that was extended to all cells arise from pre-existing cells by uh, a Russian um, investigator, Rudolf Virch Virchow. Okay, so I wanted to finally move on to this final part of Chapter 1, which is really um, an overview of the course. Um, and um, a lot of what we're going to do in the course is to talk about how microorganisms are linked to disease, even though the majority of microorganisms that we know of are um, harmless to us as humans, obviously for... Um, clear reasons, um, we are going to focus on those that small portion of microbes that are associated with human disease. So what is it, the big question that we're going to address is what is it that make these microorganisms that cause disease in humans different from all of those other microorganisms that are 
uh, essential to our ecosystem, but that are harmless to us, right? So one of the first um, observations, um, even before we knew um, what microbes were, um, we understood what disease was. We understood that disease could cause the human organism to go into a state of um, ill health and um, that the state was altered from that healthy um, status of the, of the organism. And so uh, it wasn't really until the first observations of these tiny invisible organisms um, that scientists and physicians started to make a link between and make, get some idea that there was a link between um, these tiny in, invisible forms of life and the health status of uh, humans. Um, and so there are a few really important contributors to this idea. Um, one was a uh, Muslim physician and philosopher, Ibn Sina, who noted um, that specific diseases had, um, excuse me, specific diseases are caused by specific kinds of microbes. So he made that link between microbes and disease and that not every microbe would cause the same disease that different microbes were associated with different symptoms. Um, uh, also, Florence Nightingale, um, a really um, influential figure in the field of nursing, first to write a nursing textbook and really to um, establish uh, a curriculum for uh, training nurses, and also the first to um, really record the significance of death um, due to disease, um, due to infectious disease. Um, and here's a figure um, from one of her publications um, where she basically graphed out and did uh, the statistics um, to show that um, infectious disease was a major contributor to death um, during um, wartime from uh, 1855 to 1856. And you can see that by the um, blue wedges, which are representing the infectious diseases, being much larger than the um, pale red wedges, which are death due to battle wounds, which also could be um, as a result of uh, sepsis. Um, or the presence of a uh, systemic infection um, with microbes, and then other unknown um, causes in the black wedges. So you could see during this um, period of time from April all the way to um, November and December, um, the largest wedge um, for most of these months was the um, mortality or the deaths due to infectious diseases. And then finally, later, uh, Robert Koch, Koch um, developed um, steps to actually prove this relationship that Ibn Sina had originally made between, uh, noticed between um, that link between microbes and specific infectious diseases. And so he developed a certain uh, sequence of uh, steps that you could do in order to um, really demonstrate that link. And I'll come to that in a minute. Um, but really these statistics that um, Florence Nightingale um, began collecting and then uh, became the foundation for what we now call epidemiology or the study of public health. And these statistics are really key and highlighting what would otherwise go unnoticed as far as the trends in infectious diseases. So here are a couple of um, graphs that are typical of op recordings of uh, for infectious diseases or made by epidemiologists in their practice. So the first one on the top here with the blue bars is the number of hospitalizations. So you can see uh, the, the weeks of the year um, are 
on the x-axis, and you can see that from weeks, say, about 42 to 45, there's a peak in hospitalizations. And then um, down at the bottom here in these gold peaks, uh, gold bars uh, show the number of deaths at that hospital. And you can see um, that the hospital deaths follow quickly after that peak in hospitalizations. There's a subsequent peak in deaths. Um, so these kinds of observations are important for improving public health, improving practice in hospitals to avoid um, and prevent um, not only um, deaths, but also the spread of disease. Uh, and two uh, organizations that are really major contributors to this worldwide are the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention here in Atlanta in the U.S., um, also known as the CDC and um, the World Health Organization, also known as the WHO, um, which is um, more involved in worldwide, not just uh, national um, diseases, but also um, diseases worldwide, and really in the world we live on uh, with such frequent um, global travel. Um, most diseases are a global concern um, if they're highly infectious. So I'm just going to take a moment to uh, go over this interesting case that's uh, outlined in Chapter 1. Um, a farm worker came, um, had the job of burying cows that had died of anthrax. Anthrax is a, an infectious disease that kills um, domesticated animals um, like cattle and sheep and it's caused by a bacterium called Bacillus anthracis. Um, and although he was, uh, took care to wear um, gloves when handling the carcasses of these animals, um, he did come down with a, um, an infection shortly after um, performing this job. So these lumps that he found um, on his cheek um, progressed and got worse and opened. And so he went to the doctor and he wanted to find out what was going on. It didn't look normal. And um, so the doctor found that there was a very firm nodule of tissue um, that had a kind of inflamed reddish purple ring. And then there was black over the um, dead tissue that was in the center of the ring. Um, he prescribed antibiotics, um, which is standard for um, treating a skin infection form of anthrax. And um, the patient showed improving improvement upon this um, treatment. Um, and um, in in uh, testing the patient just to confirm that his um, diagnosis was correct, the patient's serum or that portion of blood um, that doesn't ca carry any of the blood cells was tested for antibodies that were specific for the, uh, an the microbe or the bacteria that cause anthrax, the bacillus uh, anthracis. And indeed, it revealed the presence of antibodies specific for just that bacteria um, present in his serum. And so that was a way that the laboratory test could confirm the doctor's initial diagnosis. So the interesting thing about the um, bacillus species, not just bacillus anthrax, anthracis, but also other species, is that they are endospore-forming bacteria. And we'll learn more about this important dormant or resting form of bacteria that differs from the actively growing um, stick-like bacteria in this uh, scanning EM. Um, so the, the spores are in the red here, or the pink, and the normally growing multiplying bacteria are in this kind of um, yellow-gold color. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about the structure of bacteria and the various forms of bacteria. Um, so the interesting thing about anthrax is, is that it happened also to be the organism that Robert Koch um, 
was studying when he developed his, the Koch postulates. And um, what he did was he developed a way of actually growing the microorganism, the bacteria, in a lab setting. Um, and he grew just, he discovered a way to grow just that one type of bacteria and no others, so he, which is called a pure culture. It's the growth of a single type of microorganism um, in this kind of nutrient-rich rich media, which can be either uh, in a solid form or a liquid form. And we're going to learn about the, and use these um, kinds of techniques in lab this semester. So the, the steps that he established to link a specific pathogen with a specific disease are these four steps. First, you have to find the microbe in all cases of the disease, um, but not in healthy individuals. Second, you had to isolate the microbe and grow it in pure culture. Third, um, you had to test the microbe's ability to cause disease by introducing it into a host animal or into a healthy human. Um, and waiting to see if the same symptoms, signs and symptoms occurred. Uh, and then finally, you had to once again isolate that same microbe from the test uh, animal or test host. So these four um, steps were our important criteria um, that have enabled us to identify the cause of many, many infectious diseases. However, they don't always work for every um, pathogen. Uh, so for example, mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is a causative agent, um, it's a bacteria that causes tuberculosis in humans, um, actually only causes symptoms in about 10% of the people who have been exposed are infected with this bacteria. Um, so Step one was not fulfilled in that case. Um, in the case of HIV, it's often at very low levels and just, uh, very hard to detect in the early stages before it progresses to AIDS. Um, and, so, and also, the, the um, host, um, there's uh, not a, an effective or a good um, animal host for uh, experimenting and of course experimenting with humans would be unethical so there's a limitation in how far you can go with these four postulates um, in some in the cases of some infectious diseases um, one story that I want to share with you though is about Barry Marshall an Australian physician who was so convinced um, because of the correlation that he saw with many, many, almost all of his patients having a bacterial infection um, with Helicobacter um, pylori um, when they came in and complained of symptoms of ulcers um, or ulcerative colitis, so an inflammation of the colon um, in the form of Ice, um, in the form of ulcers. Um, and when he f tested these patients, he found that they had um, Helicobacter pylori in their um, stomach, and it was colonizing the stomach. And um, so he boldly um, stepped up, and he and some of his lab um, co-workers decided to test the uh, Koch postulates on themselves, um, steps three and step four. And they actually drank a pure culture of Helicobacter pylori, infected themselves, um, showed that they got the same symptoms uh, as the ulcer patients, and then cured themselves with an antibiotic. Uh, and really, it was, wasn't until this bold move that the rest of the medical community, who was convinced it was simply lifestyle changes, um, such as high stress that would um, contribute to ulcers, 
Um, but in, so until then, he had a very, uh, Barry Marshall had a very hard time convincing the rest of the medical community that this was not simply a lifestyle symptom, it was actually an infectious disease. Um, and so now routine um, treatment of the symptoms of ulcers is to test for Helicobacter pylori and then to treat with antibiotics. So one other um, thing that, uh, topic that we'll be covering um, in our study of microbes and their association with humans and their um, link to diseases is uh, how we control these microbes. So I've already mentioned about antibiotics and we're all familiar with how antibiotics can control or cure a person of an infection. Um, they're also um, early on um, when, even really before microbes were observed, there were um, some physicians that noticed that um, there was a correlation between um, the patient death and the presence of uh, uh, microbes. And so one of those physicians was Ignaz Semmelweis, um, and he found that there was a very high mortality rate in um, the maternity ward of his hospital, but that, uh, and that it was often correlated with physicians coming from um, the surgical suite um, uh, surgery on another patient and um, without washing their hands, going to um, aid in a delivery. And um, so he ordered doctors to wash their hands in a chemical chlorine um, that served as an antiseptic. And uh, by, definite, by that, I mean a chemical that kills microbes. Um, and he found that the mortality rate fell by 80% after that. Still, doctors were set in their way, and they refused to accept his findings. But of course, now we know that hospitals routinely have hand washing uh, protocols um, in place um, to prevent the spread of infection from patient to patient. Another important um, historical figure in this effort to control pathogens was Joseph Lister. And he noted that um, in the, again, he was a surgeon and he um, worked with, in this case with a lot of um, patients that um, were undergoing amputations and he noticed that about 50% of his patients died after the operation of a systemic infection called sepsis. So he began to use antiseptic agents um, directly on the skin of the um, amputee as well as to treat um, the pre-treat the surgical instruments in between using them from one patient and another. And he found a dramatic drop in the rate of death after um, amputation as a result of these simple step steps. And so today it's really important uh, for the surgical suite to actually be um, what we call fully aseptic. Um, it's almost completely, we can't really say completely free of microbes, but it's almost completely um, free of microbes. Certainly the, the surgical instruments are completely free of microbes. They're sterile um, and um, extra, um, extra time is taken for the washing of hands um, in of those involved in the surgery. Um, surgical gloves are worn when handling, um, when undergoing the surgery, and the patient's skin, which is now actually one of the sources of infection post-surgery, um, is also treated with, um, with antiseptics that can um, provide a somewhat aseptic environment even on the skin of the um, individual undergoing surgery. So as I mentioned, one, another way to control uh, 
pathogen is, is the use of antibiotics. So how did we come about um, discovering antibiotics? And that was really a key observa observation um, made actually just serendipitously, just by accident, um, when um, Alexander Fleming left a plate of the bacteria that he was um, studying out over uh, a period of several days when he was out of the lab. And he came back and was going to throw out the, the plates since they were quite old by that time. Um, he normally only grew the, the plates overnight, um, or at the most over two nights. Um, and, except for that he noticed that there was something else growing on one of the plates and that that something else had prevented the growth of the bacteria in that area, had actually killed off the bacteria that had previously been growing in that area of the plate. And so you can see over here this white dot represents that um, mold um, that he found growing on the plate and the um, smaller gray dots um, and areas of growth that you see on the dark background, which is the uh, nutrient-rich media that the bacteria are the bacteria growing on that nutrient-rich media. So you can see right around that large white dot of mold, you don't see these smaller dots uh, of bacteria growing. So that was really an important observation. But he was actually unable to figure out how to purify whatever it was that the mold was producing that was um, toxic to the bacteria. And it was instead a couple of other um, biochemists that were able to um, purify it, um, one of which was uh, Ernst Chain. And so once they purified it, they were able to test it um, in a patient with a, um, a staphylococcal infection. And staphylococcus was the um, various species, Staphylococcus aureus being one species that was studied by Alexander Fleming, causes a skin infection in humans. And so this antibiotic was tested in an individual, actually a, a British policeman that was sick with Staphylococcus. And he made a remarkable recovery um, before actually um, going back into uh, um, before the bacteria actually ended up um, regrowing and reinfecting him and actually leading to his, his death um, because they had run out of the antibiotics. So, but that was really the first demonstration that antibiotics could possibly uh, cure in, uh, individuals of infection. And we now know that antibiotics are used routinely to treat um, bacterial infections, and really it has been revolutionary because most of what threatened the um, health of individuals prior to antibiotics were uh, common bacterial infections um, that would result sometimes in it being necessary to um, remove that part of the body that was infected in order to prevent a systemic infection or sepsis which is highly fatal. Okay, so I'm going to leave you with that and um, just remind you that um, there's some practice problems in the book. The, you should be doing the thought questions throughout the chapter. The answers are in the back of each chapter. And then I have uh, highlighted a few of the review questions and the clinical questions at the end of the chapter that I think you should focus on. Um, and again, the answers you can find in the back glossary of the book.